Hi, folks, and welcome to the Social Marketing Academy. I'm your host, Christopher Tompkins. I have a really great show today. I'm going to be talking to my friend Alex, who is an animation expert, and he has the answers to all the questions that you've posed over the last few weeks. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Alex in just a minute. But before we get started, I wanted to welcome you all to today's episode. If you are new to the show, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope you really enjoy the content that we share. The Social Marketing Academy is all about trying to showcase the expertise of the people within my network. I, I'm connected with, I have a really, really great network of professionals that I want you to have access to. And guess what? I get quest asked questions all the time from prospective clients, um, current clients, peers, whatever, on a lot of these topics. So I thought, why don't we bring these to you? So it's basically like an hour long digital marketing free consultation, which isn't a bad deal, right? So please do check out our past shows and subscribe to our show so you don't miss updates. We do this as a live feed um, with video as well as our RSS feed through our podcast. Um, if you'd like to learn more about my agency, the Go Agency, and contact us with any questions or upcoming topics you'd like to have covered, go to the website gosalesandmarketing.com. Again, that's gosalesandmarketing.com. All of our social links are there. We're offering a free e-course as well as a blog that has tons of great information that will kind of help take you to the next level. So what can I say about my friend, Alex Herter? Okay, Alex Herter, I wanted to have on the show uh, because a lot of you were talking about video and the use of video and the importance of video, especially like over the past, um, you know, crazy 2020, a lot of people had some time to kind of sit with what they were uh, with their marketing strategy and look at some of the things that they were neglecting because they had no time to really execute those things. And video was one of them. And tied directly to video is animation and the power of animation on your business website, in your social media, in your presentations. A lot of people have always asked me about this, but then it kind of gets to the point where they just have some stops and they have further questions. And I'm not an animation expert, which is why I wanted to bring Alex on to answer your questions. So he's gonna have some really great insights on how you can utilize animation for your business. Now, let's talk, let me tell you just a little bit about Alex. He started the animation studio Duck and Duck back in 2009 with his best friend, Dave. And since then, they've been creating compelling content for nonprofits, brands, and anyone else who shares their passion for telling good stories. He's an expert storyteller. In the past couple of years, they have worked with leading organizations all over the world, including the American Red Cross, the World Bank, Nestle, Patagonia, and even the Biden presidential campaign. Before starting Duck and Duck, Alex did marketing for a public health technology company, did some TV work in London, and helped an HIV clinic in South Africa upgrade their IT infrastructure. Um, he is, uh, he has so much knowledge within this area as well as experience. So I'm really happy to welcome him to the show today. He's going to be able to answer all of your questions dealing with animation. And here he is, Alex, how are you doing? Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate yeah. it. No problem at all. Um, I was just going through and introducing you to all of our viewers and listeners. Um, but you know, I say this to all my guests. Tell everybody about yourself in a few words and what you're what you're up to. Do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right now, what I'm up to is is attempting to balance, uh, you know, having two little kids at home and doing remote schooling and also trying to keep a small animation studio afloat. Uh, <laughs> but overall, you know, I've spent the last 12 years uh, doing tell, doing animated storytelling, uh, you know, doing anything from advertising to documentary. Um, and I just I really enjoy it. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, I, when I was uh, when I was going through kind of um, some some of the bio items that you shared with me. Uh, did you live in South Africa when you were working for that firm? So, so you lived in Cape Town? No, I lived over in uh, so South Africa. So South Africa went through a long time of um, this split government called apartheid, yeah. where there were basically there's a tiny portion, I think it was 10 to 15% of the population was white. Um, and the rest of them were obviously black South Africans, but mm -hmm. the white minority wanted to disempower all of the, uh, all of the, the black Africans, the South Africans. Right. And mm -hmm. so what they did is they created these reservations, they called them Bantustans or homelands. Yeah. And it's basically they took the crappiest land throughout the country. I think there were nine or 11 of them 
and there was one in the far east um, called Masoi. And okay. I was in Masoi, which is now called Masoi Tribal District, but it's a former homeland, oh. very near the border with Mozambique. Uh, it actually it actually right borders Kruger National Park, which is a okay, huge yeah. safari park. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was I was there. I was in a little, I was in what's called the uh, outside of a little town called White River, uh, mm -hmm. out in Pumalanga Province. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Were you able to make it to Kruger? Oh yeah, all the time. I mean, it was oh. you know the the district and and Kruger sort of border each other. So okay. You just drive and you can just drive in. You get a pass and you just drive in. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I it's funny because I was looking through where you've lived and I've I've lived in both of the places as well. I've lived in London and South Africa. Oh yeah. And um yeah, and it was it was so funny because when you mentioned Kruger, I was just like. I bet he went because because uh, I didn't get to go because Cape, oh. Cape Town to Cougar was not it was it's a little bit of a drive. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a drive. Um, but that no, it's really interesting that common ground, just the two similar places. And where did when you were in London, where did you live? Uh, I stayed with family. So my um, oh, nice. I it's funny on my dad's side, they go back to I think they I think my dad's in the Mayflower Society. So on my dad's side, there's like really deep roots here in the US. And on my mom's side, she was an immigrant from the UK. And so I'm, I'm okay, first, first generation and not. And so gotcha. uh, when I was in London, I just stayed with my family um, in a neighborhood called St. John's Wood in the near Northwest. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's yeah, gorgeous area. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I had I had some friends in that area. And I like the in so you're you were Fairly, what's, oh my gosh, am I having like a brain issue? It, it's very close to Hempstead, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, the Heath and all that good stuff. Yeah, it's just north of that. Yeah, I know, I love that area. Um, I was in I was in Islington and mm -hmm. Hackney and Chiswick and I, I bounced around, I was there for a while. That's um, great. But, yeah, but no, really interesting. Um, so we've gotten lots of really uh, interesting questions. I was kind of like, before I brought you on, I was just telling everyone, that uh, one of the things that happened in 2020 was a lot of people had time to look at the look at certain marketing aspects or tools or just the things that they tactics that they were always wanted to they were interested in trying out but then it was time time just takes me away from everything I don't have any time yeah. well everybody had a little bit of time to think about yeah. some stuff uh, I mean, one of the things one of the trends that I saw last year was people asking me um, prospective clients and even just just people in my network asking me questions about services that I've been trying to get off the ground for years, but no one want, no one could commit to just letting themselves go that far to kind of get into that creative element. Yeah. And, and video is one of the things that I've seen really, really pop up quite, quite, a, quite a bit and tied directly to that is animation. So I'm really, um, uh, I'm really interested to hear your take on some of these questions that we got from our audience. So let me just kind of throw out the first one. Right. Um, and the, don't be insulted by these. These are by our, our loyal, lovely listeners. So uh, <laughs> they, and they, and they all love you uh, already. All right. So is animation inherently less serious or less professional than other kinds of content? Yeah, that's, uh, that's an objection that we run into a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. Typically, it's not the objection raised by the person who we're talking to, but it's very often a manager or someone, some other stakeholder in the in the decision uh, is going to say, well, yeah, but like animation is cartoons and cartoons are very sort of unserious. Um, and we do a lot of work for a lot of very serious uh, organizations. We work, mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of work for the World Bank, for the Inter-American Development Bank, for um, you know, the Gates Foundation for mm -hmm. those sorts of folks. And that's where I see that objection more. But actually, each one of these organizations uses animation all the time. Yeah. Um, typically, it's in it's in an explainer format, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's typically a one to three minute video that explains exactly why, you know, this debt finance instrument is the right one for you, you know, government minister. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to use the World Bank as an example. Right, right. Um, so no, of course, it's not inherently more juvenile or, or not serious. Um, the cool thing about animation is that it's incredibly flexible. In fact, I want to take a step back and sort of redefine or maybe use do a little bit of vocab here. So animation, yeah, no. mm -hmm. animation overall is basically anything where you have moving pictures. Um, mm -hmm. So animation definitely covers Bugs Bunny. Um, 
but it actually also it covers Pixar and 3D, which is a totally different technique, yep. but obviously similar demographic audience there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also covers what's called motion graphics. And I know you and a bunch of people in the design world will know exactly what motion graphics are, mm -hmm. but uh, that's a term that actually some folks don't, don't know what it is. And basically yes. that's, um, if you watch a, let's say you're watching a, a truck commercial or you're watching just a regular commercial mm -hmm. and you know, there's, there's cool B-roll of a truck going over Hills and there's like words that stamp in and say, you know, can tow 50 million tanks mm -hmm. or whatever that is. That is motion graphics. So we see motion graphics all over the place and that is also a subset of animation. Mm -hmm. And so animation as a whole is hard to write off. Um, you're right, of course, cartoons can be more juvenile, um, but it can work for anything from as sophisticated as explaining why a satellite works mm -hmm. to um, you know, entertaining my, my four-year-old and teaching him how to, how to do simple math mm -hmm. uh, and really every, everything in between. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, a common, it's a common misconception. And I mean, I feel for you because I, I mean, I was, I was selling social media services 10 years ago and you know that i mean that was i mean and talk about and also just starting off as your owning your own agency like i was i was giving myself my own stockholm syndrome by just like a one i was like doing a one person version of it um as in like am i actually selling things that matter <laughs> because people just don't understand what the concepts really are and animation is one of those things where people immediately think disney immediately think uh, warner brothers looney tunes going back to cartoons and but we're not saying cartoons, we're saying animation. Animation right. means movement. Right. And um, it's interesting that you point out the motion graphics because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people forget uh, because they think, oh, this is gonna be all drawn, right. right? This is all gonna be rendered. It's not, I can't use myself in that. Or right. it's gonna be a cartoon or caricature of myself. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. I mean, you, obviously if that was what the creative called for, you do it. but. Um, what do you find in terms of, in your businesses, like what, what do your clients ask for the most? What medium do they like um, for their explainer videos? Uh, so the bulk of our work is in, actually the bulk of our work takes place in a program called Adobe After Effects, which is part yeah. of the creative suite. Um, and uh, even, if, even if we're creating certain scenes or certain elements elsewhere, mm -hmm almost every project comes back to After Effects for compositing at the end. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the projects never actually leave After Effects because mm -hmm. it's it's effectively, think about Adobe Illustrator, right? Which is a multi-layered vector-based uh, illustration tool. Mm -hmm. After Effects is effectively Adobe Illustrator on a timeline. Right. And of course, video is a time-based medium, which is a phrase I may come back to in this conversation because <laughs> I think about it a lot. You know, it's it's, you can do all the work that, that gets done in a video in this, in this sort of way. So we'll do storyboarding, we'll do concepting all in After Effects. Mm -hmm. um, but we also use, we use other tools like we use Cinema 4D for 3D uh, work. Right. Um, we, we use a lot of, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have done a lot in Adobe Animate, which is, what Flash was renamed, yeah. Uh, but we actually now do a lot of more of that work in Toon Boom, which is like, which is really explicitly a cartooning tool. Yeah, uh, we do a kid series for the American Red Cross uh, in in that platform, and oh, that's awesome. It, and yeah. it only at the end comes into After Effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, almost all animation is digital these days. Obviously, yes. there, there was a time when you would actually write on glass, and there are still people who do that. You know, they write mm -hmm. on cells, which are little, mm -hmm. you know, plastic movie, you know, actual yeah. frames. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never done that. No one on my team has, has done that outside of art school. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can simulate it with a drawing tablet. And uh, yeah, the, the process is, is all digital for us. Yeah. And it, it, so one of the things that I've always, it, I've always found power in for organizations, and I feel like they sleep on it a little bit, is the power of the explainer video. And you've mentioned that before. Um, I just want to bring that point back up again, because I feel that there's um, there's power in that as being a starting point into understanding how that can work for your company. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I mean, a lot of companies that want to get involved with YouTube, if you want to start a YouTube channel, one of the things that's most powerful for you to have on the top of your page is your, is your explainer video. If you're going onto your website, um, having that explainer video on your homepage or on your about. Mm -hmm. But 
I think I'm, we're saying this like everybody knows what the hell we're talking about. What, in your words, how would you explain what an ex <laughs> explainer video is? <laughs> luckily, luckily, I've made hundreds. I've written hundreds of explainer scripts. So if I get this back, if I can't do this, I think <laughs> we have time for you to move on. Um, yeah, an explainer is very simple. It's it's a you know typically it's a thirty second to three minute um, video. Very often it's all animated. Mm -hmm. um, that really answers the basic questions of what something is about or how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, there are variations. Um, you know, explainer journalism has been a big trend in the last I'd say four or five years. The best the best practitioners of that are Vox. Uh, Vox mm -hmm. is Fox's YouTube channel uh, is incredible. It's full of all these wonderful explainers. They, they've sort of evolved it from that corporate Silicon Valley explainer, which was all animated into something that has, it, it mixes live action, it mixes stock photography, it mixes collage and animation where appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely see them as the gold standard for kind of explainer journalism or longer form mm -hmm. explainers which is funny because even that, even those are only like seven minutes long um, yeah. in, my, in my world, that's long form. Yes. Um, and I think another question that's sort of nested within that question is like, where do explainers go and, and yes. how do you use them or where, what do I do with these things? Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually something that I talk to clients a lot about. There's, you know, when you run a, when you run an agency, I'm sure you appreciate this. When you run an agency, you do have maybe five or six conversations often right like, yes there's, there's, there's <laughs> almost like a track that you fall into um, of course yeah and one of the ones that that i have a lot of is um basically there's this understanding that okay i'll have a video and a video will solve my problem um but yes. the, the reality is that no content will solve your problem uh mm -hmm. because content itself first of all it's really hard to get in front of people um mm -hmm. by itself and content itself isn't necessarily going to move someone the multiple steps they need to do something. Exactly. And so I actually have a lot of conversations where someone comes to us and says, hey, we want a video, we want an explainer. And the first thing I have to do is go, whoa, now, I'm not sure you do. Help me understand where it should go. And mm -hmm. what we'll do is we'll actually, we'll go through what I will call the viewer journey, but you could call it the customer journey or the donor <laughs> journey or whatever, and say, okay, do you want a video to solve this problem at the top of the funnel? Do you want a video, in other words, to attract interest? That's a totally different kind of video. And honestly, mm -hmm. an explainer is bad at that. Mm -hmm. um, do you want a video that, you know, converts an already interested, say someone who already subscribes to your newsletter to donate to your organization? Mm -hmm. you know, do you want a conversion tool, a piece of content that will kind of mm -hmm. generate the interest from step three to step four? Mm -hmm. In that case, explainers are fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Or do you want a video that is going to go to your already really engaged audience? Uh, I've been using nonprofits a lot because that's most of what we do, but let's, right. let's use a, a corporate example. Do you want a video that you can send to your, your frequent customers uh, that they can post on their, on their social media or something? And for their explainers are actually maybe not so good. What I think of there is what you want is a, um, you want a declaration or, or, or what I call an identity video or an identity yeah. affirmation video. So you can say, yeah, you're one of us. Um, you believe in what we believe in. This is who you are. This is who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think of a example we did for Patagonia uh, last year that was very much about like the corporate values of Patagonia, which right. probably isn't bringing new people in, but it'll take people like me who love Patagonia mm -hmm. and say, yes, this is why I pay you know, $180 for a pair of jeans or whatever it is, right? It's because like <laughs> these people are, I actually have never bought jeans there. That's a bad example, but, <laughs> um, but you know, this is why I'm a huge fan. And so different types of content work best at different places. All of them can be animation or incorporate animation. Right. Um, but yeah, that's a super rambly answer to your question. No, that's right. That's right. I enjoyed the ramble. I'm thinking that one of the things that I always say to my clients is um, when we're talking about content strategy, um, once we get on, we're going through the onboarding process and we're going, we're, we're doing that, 
that period, which is uncomfortable for the client a little bit, where you're kind of like shaking up and molding some different pieces that aren't kind of like fully formed and you're, you're, you're putting your hands in the soil a little bit more. Yeah. And um, they always, they always wonder like, how are you going to create content for us? And I said, well, the first place that we're going to look is through your FAQs. Mm -hmm. What questions, how are we going to engage people if we don't know what they're frequently asking you? And then we can kind of build content around there. Now that right there for me is a part where some of our clients have said, well, you know, we've, we've heard about video explainers. And I do feel that um, there was one client of ours that was, I was really impressed and uh, which I'm very hard to impress, but I was really impressed. And their um, FAQ page was all explainer videos mm. and they, but they were not, they were 30 seconds, 20 seconds. They yeah. were like bite size, easy yeah. to go. And I, and I was thinking to myself, wow, if I didn't watch these, I wouldn't have no idea what they would do, what they were doing. Because um, a lot of companies uh, struggle with kind of building up their credibility yeah. and, they're, and they're so worried about building credibility and visibility, but then they're building visibility out of something that nobody understands. Yeah. So it's nice to have that piece to explain, because I also find that um, if we're looking for additional piece, places where I would say explainer videos would live, um, if you're doing a short version of a full explainer, I would say that that's perfect for um, social media advertising. Absolutely. That's also really wonderful if you were to piece it out and do retargeting ads based off of that for any of your website hits for a certain page of your service. Maybe you have multiple services. Maybe there's multiple videos associated with that. Um, there's lots of different things. I, I mean, one of the, one of my rules of thumb is that if you think that you cannot use animation in anything that you're doing, are you using PowerPoint still? Right. Are you using PowerPoint? Um, are you using a uh, keynote? Are you mm -hmm. using Canva templates? I, I, I mean, that all can be done through animation. Even Canva yeah. for, for God's sakes is, is saying, let's animate this. And it's just basically yeah. flipping to the next page. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Go Canva. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of how I think because I've, I've actually had clients that we've worked on their um, presentations for them for branding presentations. And, and I'm like, well, have you just thought about not doing it like this and doing it? I mean, like in the today world, yeah. uh, I mean, I, uh, just opening up PowerPoint really hurts me. Uh, yeah. It, it just, it hurts my soul. Cause I feel that you can very easily translate that in a different way that's more impactful than- yeah. Yeah, we've done uh, for years. We used to do uh, the the former head, the former president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation mm -hmm. uh, would give. They have an annual, big annual conference, and their president would give like the the anchor keynote. Um, and we actually we designed those uh, in in consultation with their creative team. Yeah, and we made them all real, basically really long explainer animations. Uh, because in Keynote, you can actually embed, you can embed movie files. Yep. Uh, and so what you can do is you can basically have something where you control the timeline. Mm -hmm. You can like page through, but the whole thing actually feels like one video. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how to sell this. I don't know who to sell this to, but mm -hmm. I'm convinced it's just wonderful because having the person there is really important, right? Because they're, they're able to convey that human, that human element. They're the expert in this case, you know, it's the head of the organization that you're a member of. Uh, but instead of clicking through a bunch of static uh, images, you're, you're actually able to walk through, okay, now I'm gonna talk about how this housing project changed this neighborhood. And you, you hit the button and then the first 20 seconds of the video happens and then, then it stops and she's able to talk a little bit more. And then the next 10 seconds happens and it stops and she's, and she's able to address it more. I really think this kind of like interactive premium presentation animation, I don't know exactly, I'm terrible at naming things, but someone could name this as, you know, presentation plus, or again, terrible at it. Uh, <laughs> but I really think this is a product that like needs to be out there more and we'd love to do more of it because it is a cool way to use animation in a different way. Yeah, and I think that uh, just from the presentations that I've seen recently, oh boy, um, just uh, just uh, from some of the classes that um, I've just been betting for, just just different things I've seen. Um, it, it's like twenty years ago, and I'm in college putting something together, and and I feel that when I see the website, the website's like this beautiful like car, and then I see the presentation, and it's like a rusted bike. And it's kind of 
that disparity really does hurt, especially if you're trying to use your webinars to convince, like your webinars or presentations or whatever you're doing. You're trying to use them to convince people that you are a credible resource and that they should spend money with you. And then you have your intern knock out a PowerPoint. Give me a break, buddy. It's not yeah. going to work. I mean, yeah. that's that's not how you're going to convert. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think that would be a really, really great service. You have to name that. Um, Someone so, else has to name it. What? Someone what? else has to name it. <laughs> that's it. That's your first social media contest that you can do. Name the product. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how to write a compelling, how do you write a compelling script for something short, like a minute, less yeah. than that? How do you do that? Like, how do you come up with that script? Yeah. So luckily I don't have to do that anymore, but I did it for a long time. Okay. Uh, I, I wrote basically all of our scripts for the first oh, wow. 11, 10, 11 years of in business. Uh, and now we have producers who do that and they do a much better job, but yeah. I will, I will dust off my my knowledge here. Um, so I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one is to, if you're used to writing for readers, writing for, for content that's written, so articles or blog posts or reports or whatever, um, the first thing to do is to understand the, um, sorry about the beeping in the background. That's right. Uh, is to understand the, the word count limit. So roughly 100, 160 words per minute is kind of a casual speaking sort of pace. So mm -hmm. that's what we're doing here. We're probably at 160. I think both of us talk a little fast. So maybe we're at like mm -hmm. 180 uh, right. per minute, but, but that's normal. Mm -hmm. So that's only half a page of double spaced content. So you have one normal page, you get this much space mm -hmm. for, your, um, for your script. So I think that's the first thing to understand is that that's true. Um, Another trick that we use is to always understand that you're writing for hearing and to actually edit by speaking out loud, uh, or even to have someone else read it to you to understand that like, hey, this is a time-based medium, right? There's that, that again, um, and to understand the actual relationship of time. So I think those are two elements to get around length uh, mm -hmm. and around pacing. Some other stuff is to make sure as you're writing, you are constantly picturing what will be on screen. Even if it's not, even if you're not exactly sure, there should be a rich, a rich visual in mind. Every single sentence, in fact, every single clause should have a rich visual in mind that actually makes sense. So there are a couple of ways to do that e more easily. One thing we often do when we're writing for articles is that we bury our visuals at the end of sentences. We spend our the beginning of our sentences kind of building up, mm -hmm. setting the context and then right. hitting, right? You sort of do this like build up and hit, which reads really well, but mm -hmm. it doesn't work in animation because you want to be able to introduce the visuals first. So mm -hmm. you might want to say, um, if you're describing making, uh, making avocado toast or something, you know, you mm -hmm. might want to say, start out with imagine a piece of avocado toast you know rich green uh, rich green avocado mashed with you know red chili peppers popping out um popping out and you know attracting your eye or something and then move into how you did it as opposed to like right. first we take a piece of bread and then, <laughs> and then yeah, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. or even getting into like why we have this for breakfast um mm -hmm. so those are a few those are a few things i think Two more, uh, two more yeah. tips that I find really helpful for script yeah. writing. One is to, it's actually coming at it from both ends. So the first thing to do is to write the longer version and edit down. So if you want to get to a minute, dump all your ideas, uh, you know, go through and write four minutes of content uh, and then come back and say, okay, clearly this is not going to work. What's the least essential? Um, mm -hmm. And often you can't do that until you've actually dumped your whole thought onto the page. True. Yep. It's really hard to edit down before you write. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing. The other thing is to actually start at the bottom and define what is one sentence or even one clause, one idea that, it, that someone's going to get across. I mm -hmm. kind of have like a generic rule where you can only expect an audience to remember one thing for every 30 seconds. So if you've got a 60 second slot we're talking about two things and way 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 too many clients and everybody honestly tries to put too much into a 60 second spot mm -hmm. instead of doing what i think people should do which is say okay what are the two things and you do the classic rhetorical strategy of telling people what you're going to tell them 
telling them and then telling them what you told them, right? Because exactly. you want you want to really reinforce those two things because it's unrealistic when you're scrolling through a social media feed. It's really unrealistic to expect that they're going to remember five things from one of the 20 things that they saw while they were sitting on the toilet, right? Like that's just not reasonable. It's totally, you're totally, <laughs> you're totally, you're totally spot on. And this is when, um, this is kind of when I tried to, um, I kind of try to cons consult with my client to help them understand. And I say this all the time that yes, you are unique snowflakes. You're unique. You're, you, like, you are a unique snowflake. God, yeah. I didn't know that was gonna be a tongue twister. <laughs> Any more caffeine. Um, but you're the snowflake in a snowstorm and yeah. every snowflake is I like that. around you and it's a whiteout. So how do you get your unique POV across? And I say, you need to cut back. You need to cut directly to the bone of what, what is, tell me who you are in a sentence. Yeah. And if a client struggles to do that, I feel that they have a little bit a, of, there's a control issue and also that they don't know how to boil it down. They right. don't know what's most important. They don't know um, as much about their company as they think that they might. Um, and that's not in a, in a negative way. Uh, I, I don't mean that in a negative way as well, because I mean, if, if we're dealing with owners or we're dealing with heads of marketing, there are a lot of different things that are going on. So, you know, I can understand the being just feeling dispersed and having a lot of things that you're looking at, but when someone tells me, how am I supposed to tell my story in 140 characters? I, I say, I do it all the time. Yeah. I do it every day. Yeah. So what's different about you? Because you have three services. I don't need to know every single feature and bell and whistle about those services, or you have this amazing product. Wow. It was the first of its kind 25 years ago. Let's put that in the bio. Like, no, I want, why do I want it now? What yeah. we're doing is like for, if you're looking at your marketing strategy and you're looking at your social media posts, uh, just social media posts for the hell of it, we'll talk about that. Like you need to be hitting, it's, it's all about different touch points and how many times you're getting, you're getting exposure to your audience or impressions, what they call them. And, you know, if you're focusing on one idea in a 30 second, um, it's 30 second video, uh, then you have an ad with a st stagnant visual with has the same stagnant that you're putting into that video. And then you're doing, a, it, it's kind of, it all starts comp compounding. Yeah. And that, because everybody consumes information differently. I know personally that, I mean, come on, if we're looking at the stats that have been released recently, um, TikTok is getting more views than Facebook is. And TikTok is 100% videos. I mean, come on. I mean, who hasn't fallen down a TikTok hole? And if, if you if you want to fall down one, just join it and it's over. You're, you're gone. Bye. Um, I'll see you two in two hours. Um, <laughs> when, when I say, what did you look at? You're like, oh. But, um, but yeah, it's it's important to to consider how to boil down your message to the really meaty bits. Um, and sometimes, yeah, maybe you need a couple different videos to do that. Um, yeah. but, but still... It's trying to get the most important parts of your business and bring them to the forefront is the way forward. Um, this, oh, we, well, but, but what about this? And oh, we can't, we can't forget to talk about this. And it's like, well, why don't you do that when you talk to them? Like, yeah. why don't you, when you actually convert them, maybe you can yep. tell them all this extra crap that no one cares about right now. That's just yep. noise. Uh, Okay, let's 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 move on to another question that was that was posed, Alex. Um, how can I make sure that my audience sees our content? Now that's like that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, so this one, admittedly, I am I am not the expert in this. I've been around a lot of content campaigns. Obviously, we've created a lot of content for campaigns, right. but we actually don't do we don't do a lot of placement or promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, Every now and then we're, you know, we, we do it because we've, we've been asked and it seems kind of simple. Right. Um, so I guess there are a couple of answers to that. Uh, one is to kind of acknowledge that the days of organic reach are, are, are gone to some degree. Um, yes. You know, it is almost all the content that is consumed uh, is consumed on YouTube on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Um, I would also say TikTok, but almost everything on TikTok is, is user generated. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of, it's just not our space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say those four platforms, really, that's it. And those four platforms have very deliberately pulled up the ladder in terms of organic content getting, getting real reach. Um, mm -hmm. And so the first answer is a really depressing one, which is that you have to spend more money to get views on those platforms. Uh, everyone yep. has kind of a, yep. a different rule of thumb on like what, what percentage of a budget should go to promotion versus content. Obviously I'm on the content creation side. So I think you should spend, you know, half your budget on content and half your budget on promotion. Mm. But, you know, I've got, I've got a friend who's at LinkedIn who does ad sales and, you know, she's, she, without batting an eye, will say that 90% of your campaign budget should be promotion. Um, and so if you've got a million dollar campaign, only a hundred thousand of that should go to content. Um, and obviously mm -hmm. some people think it should be a one to five ratio or one to two ratio. Everyone's got their own reasons uh, and their own ideas. But one thing to realize is that any content you are seeing, they're probably playing in that kind of ratio space. You know, they're, they're probably spending twice as much than the content for promotion or more. Um, so that's the really obvious way to get, to get views, but there are other ways. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, uh, there are some amazing production companies and I'll have to follow up uh, with a link to share, but there's an amazing production company out in Colorado that actually they do impact promotion. So what they'll do is instead of doing paid promotion, they'll actually hire someone to go and personally get content in schools or oh, get cool. content uh, to be incorporated on maybe public television or do do the really old fashioned PR thing and actually yeah. reach out to reporters and say, hey, here's some content that might be valuable. Um, I'm really excited about that. As I've said before, most of our work is with nonprofits. And so I'm really excited about how can we get cause messages out there in right. a way that doesn't take most of the money and send it to these four companies or three companies. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, it's a complicated space uh, in terms of getting getting actual audience members. And I think, you know, working with someone like you and building a really engaged base, a really engaged organic audience is obviously going to help any content that you produce later on down the line. Um, mm -hmm. I, th I think like to kind of dovetail into what you were saying, Alex, is that I think if you're going to create if you are going to decide that animation is going to be the great uh, the, the, the way forward for you, um, I really do feel that you have to understand where you're going to be putting it before you even start it. And yeah. I think that that will help you understand because here's what happens all the time. And I mean, how many times have you seen this? I'm saying this because I'm, I know it's happened to you. Someone gets this beautiful video, like they, you create this amazing thing. They give you a really good budget for it. So you can really kind of go above and beyond. You create a series or a video or whatever the hell you create and they get it. And then they're like, oh, I didn't know that I was going to have to do something extra in order to promote it. Oh, I just spend all my butt. So you mean that I, I'm not going to be able to do this, this, and this because of this. And it's, it's inherent because people get distracted by shiny things and you have a very shiny thing, which is funny because once they start seeing what you're doing, they're like, wow. And I'm telling you, anyone that's listening to my voice, if you look into animation for your company, you're going to be wowed. You're going to get really engaged. You're going to be like, why didn't I do this sooner? It's because you just, you could be lazy. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not judging you, but it could be a lazy thing. Um, but I definitely think it's something you should consider. But going back to um, thinking about it, promotion is definitely like when we're talking about social media um, or you're talking about email marketing or you're talking about um, placements or you're talking about getting featured in blogs, all of this stuff requires money. And also experts that know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So if you do have a social media, if, if your marketing department is equipped with the people that are experts to do this, that's wonderful. But you still have to understand that there's money that's associated with promoting this content. Yeah. Um, what Alex said is very true. The things that you're seeing on social media from these mega brands, it's because they're spending a good, good amount of money. Uh, I mean, I, every single prospect that comes to me says, well, look at my direct competitor. I have no idea how they're getting these numbers. And I said, they're buying them. Yeah. They're promoting themselves. They're probably spending like 10 or five to $10,000 a month on this stuff. I said, is that a five to $10,000 and I have to hire you? Well, you don't have to hire me. Um, <laughs> you can do this yourself if you want.
Yeah. Um, but uh, but no, this is there. There are fees that are associated with this, mm-hmm. and the I mean, it kills me sometimes when I see amazing amazing new clients come into my realm with some amazing content. And they're just like, this is good. We can organically kill this. I want to focus on organic build. And it's yeah. it, it's not something that really is 100% real anymore. Yeah, I think, I think there are two things that occur to me there. Uh, mm-hmm. One is owning your audience is really valuable. And we see, right, we see platforms that are allowing you to do that, um, yep. you know, OnlyFans and Substack are two platforms that are explicitly about directly engaging with someone. There's no intermediate, right? You you get someone to pay you eight dollars a month, and they're a member, and they get your content, um, mm-hmm. or you know whatever. You can set your own prices on both of those networks, and I think that's honestly that's pretty promising um, in terms of getting content out there. But one of the things that brands I think need to look at, I I think it's not an either or, I think it's a both and. Yep. Um, you also need to figure out how to actually own your own audience. Because the reality is if you have people following you on Instagram, you don't actually own that audience. That audience is, there's an intermediary between you and your audience and they decide, you know, how many of your followers are actually going to get that post? Mm-hmm. Is it going to be 4%? Is it going to be 8%? Mm-hmm. I don't know, but it's not going to be more than 10. Uh, whereas something like a, you mentioned email. I love email. Email newsletters are just the best. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love them. I, I, I think that like you actually have a relationship with that person. Yep. Uh, they've chosen to get your content. They often will look at the content and you control that relationship. So there, there is something there mm-hmm. um, to trying to find ways to kind of step back from only into only getting to your audience through Facebook, for example. Yes. Uh, Another thing I wanted to share is mm-hmm. something I like to think about is, is the cost per view for content. Yes. Uh, and I'm not going to name the clients in this case, but there's one client that, you know, we did a, we did one piece of content. It was a pre, more premium content. So it was a $75,000 video, three minute video. Um, it won awards. It's great. It's a good yeah. piece of content, but it's only gotten about 8,000 views. Wow. Um, so we're really talking about, what is that, $10 a view? More than that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like $10 a view, $8 a view. Wow. Um, and that's a lot. That's a, a high cost per view. That's very high um, cost per view. You know, whereas we did a series around the same time, we did a series for another client. We did three videos for $100,000. So it's actually more money for the content. But then they spent another eight or nine hundred thousand um, wow. dollars, so they they spent a million, roughly, mm-hmm. and but they ended up getting you know twelve million views across all channels, mm-hmm. and so there you're talking about a cost per view of ten cents, right? Uh, and so price is like actually kind of a tricky thing of like mm-hmm. what is cost? Well, mm-hmm. there's cost of making the videos. There's also cost per view. There's cost per conversion. There's cost per impression. There's all these different ways of sort of yeah. thinking about cost. And I think that it's it's pretty short sighted to think about just what is it what does it cost to pay Duke and Duck to make this content? Mm-hmm. Uh, because that act that number is only one of many data points that you need in order to make the decision. I, I completely agree with you. And another thing, I, another thing, even going further, um, we've had clients in the past. We had one client that we worked with for a, a, a little while. Um, and then uh, we were working, um, they wanted video views on Facebook. So we explained what that metric was. And they said, well, we want video views, as many as we possibly can get. And I said, you know that that's just, I could literally be just grabbing my phone and just kind of like scrolling and, and like start talking to somebody and your video is paying and then you're paying for this. Um, and I said, you know, I, I don't really feel like it's a great metric. And they're like, no, 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 no. We need this metric. We need this metric. And I said, okay, well then if that's what your goal is, let's make you reach your goal. So we like triple, triple surpassed their goal because video views on Facebook, if you, it's, it's I'm not going to reveal all about that, but, uh, I think it's, I think it's like two seconds. Yeah. It's like a five second. Okay. Yeah. Five second video view. So five <laughs> seconds and then you get counted. Right. So, um, 
So then after doing that for two months, they spent about $50,000 to get them. So obviously you can imagine how many five second video views we got. I mean, a lot yeah. would be the answer. And then they said, why aren't we getting more sales? <laughs> and, I, and I was just like, well, let's look at the funnel. Basically your funnel's over here yeah. and stuff's going in it. This is your video views. Right. It's not moving anywhere. It's not going anywhere. That's it. People just have to scroll past it for your number to be hit. Yeah. Um, or people just saying, what the hell is this? Nah. Uh, yeah. But uh, but no, it's interesting. I don't really feel like, I think you're completely right. There's so many other metrics that you really need to think about. And also I, I'm really big on, if you are going to be paying for something to be con to created for you, such as an animation, a white paper, an ebook, or any sort of thing that's going to be used as either an incentive or something to sell your product or service you or, or your cause, you should really be focused on how can I release this? And what is the conversion point that I need to make? Is it going yep. to be exchange of information? Is it going to be an email? Is it going to be an email address sign up? Is it going to be money? Is it going to be a consultation request? What is it that actually, just someone hitting the page where your video is, is not a conversion in my book. Yep. A conversion, a, a conversion for me in my book, I would say if it's a social media conversion, as soon as I get someone to interact with your content, that's a conversion for me. But if we're saying that a conversion is an email address sign up on your website, then the conversion point for me would be how many people can we get to convert on your website? And I can only control that from as, as a social media or a digital marketing company if I've actually created that form and that incentive. But oh, yeah. if you've created that, if it doesn't convert, it's your fault. But um, there's just so many ways of looking at it to get a spend. Now talking about spend, how much does like an animate, how much does a video cost? If, if we're looking at that, like, I mean, that's a wide open question, right? Yeah, so I can answer that in, in two ways. One is to say that, of course, like anything, like plates or houses or anything, you know, there is, there is someone selling at every price point. Um, oh, yeah. And so where we sit, uh, we typically, like our most typical project is a one to two minute video in the Thirty to fifty thousand dollar range. Um, okay. So, I, what I like to say is that I think we're in the ninetieth or ninety fifth percentile of quality, and probably like the eightieth percentile of cost. So, right. I think we're a good deal. In other words, yeah, um, I think it's a good price. But we're definitely a lot more expensive than if you just Google explainer animations. Um, there are a ton of really, really, honestly, pretty good shops, mostly overseas. And what they do is their costs are lower, but also they do a lot of templatized video creation. So what they'll do, um, there's a really good one out in Indonesia. I know the owner, I've worked with them a couple of times. Uh, they're called Bread and Beyond. And I say, if you've got sub 10 grand or sub 20 grand, they're a great resource. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what they're going to do is they're going to come to you and say, Hey, here are the 12 types of videos we will make. Um, and you say, yes, exactly. I want, I want type five and you know, here's the script and they go great. And they make you a video. And so there, are, there are people all over the map in terms of pricing. And then of course, at the high end, you know, the people above us, uh, you know, we just, we just narrowly lost out on a project that was a 30 second spot for a major hotel chain. And it was a $300,000 budget. Wow. Uh, and so at the high end, you're definitely talking about the hundreds of thousands into the millions. When you're looking at you know, the, the most famous studios in our space are Buck, Giant Ant, uh, Odd Fellows, and a couple of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for those folks, you know, the conversation starts at a quarter million dollars. Right. So, and it, I think they are a little bit better than us, but I think that primarily they're better than us because they have a lot more people yeah. <laughs> on their, on their projects. Of um, course. But yeah, I think there, it's a range. Um, you know, I'm always happy to, if anyone has questions, anyone who's listening or watching uh, now or later that wants to come in and say, Hey, uh, I've, I've got this idea. Um, I can try to like, at least triangulate where, where that might end up. Mm -hmm. um, Good. But, well, it's, it's, it, it, it's something that's kind of, it always concerns me because I, I get the same thing as well. And from my, from my kind of experience level, um, what I get is, you know, well, um, 
I just, the yellow page is, I just got called by the yellow pages and they're going to do all of my social media for $199 a month. And I said, well, then go with them. I mean, yeah. I, what am I going to do? I, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, they're not going to do anything for you, but if price is your motivating factor, go with the worst. Yeah. And you know, it's, I've had, <laughs> I've had people too. They're like, well, um, do you do logo design? And I said, yes. And I told them the rate and they're like, well, I'm, we were on Fiverr and I was like, wait, wait, stop, stop. We can't continue if we're going to talk about Fiverr. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I've been in business for 11 years. I'm not talking about Fiverr. Yeah. <laughs> go, go with they're them. Just they're just different things. And it's just different things. And I think it's kind of one of the things is if you are a reputable company and you are going to be investing in your brand and you are going to be doing this, understand that going to not necessarily even Fiverr, some of these other firms out there that you see, just make sure they're going to be creating something custom for you. Because if you are using templates, I mean, I, I mean, just working in the, I work, I work with lots of healthcare clients. And one of the things I see a lot is they go and go to a graphic designer. They get kind of like a cut rate and they're like, just design something beautiful. They're using the same stock image that every one of their competitors are using. Yep. And then they, then they have these beautiful pieces. And they're like, wow, this looks great. And then they go out starting to market and you're like, whoa, whoa. I have I have two thousand of these brochures, and they have the same picture as the cover of our competitor's website. Oh. So it, it, it's just it, knowing what's knowing what you want, um, and not I, I'm not a real big fan of templates unless you need to go that route because people are looking at content all the time. They're going to start seeing similarities. I mean, I can very easily like even if someone's doing um, one of our clients said, "What did you think about this opening video animation?" And I was just like. Oh, that's from Fiverr. That's from the guy that has a hundred templates. And this is one of his templates. I've seen this a million times. Yeah, you can, you can buy those and you can customize them. And honestly, like there are lots of places, you know, one of our clients is Capital One. And like, I definitely know that there are teams that are like building new products that they will use a service like 99designs or like Fiverr yeah. or something to say like, hey, just mock up 50 ideas and like just to like kickstart our brainstorming. Right. So yeah, it's, that's it's good. Like I a, like that like R&D process that I actually think is kind of cool because you get I a like whole that. set of ideas and you pay a little bit for each of them. Um, none of them are going to be the final. Um, but yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, I think, you know, and for us, you know, for us, we've got, you know, our, our senior producer was at Pixar for 12 years and our senior art director used to be at Discovery and like worked on, you know, big, big content there. Um, you know, we've got we've got some amazing character animators, 3D animators, illustrators. Um, these people are not cheap people. Uh, you know? Yeah. And, and, and most of us live in the DC area, which is also not a cheap place to live. <laughs> so it's just you know, prices are what they are. And of course. I mean, my I actually just a couple hours ago I had a a call with a with a potential client, and um, you know we were talking about price, and and I. I just said, look, I don't, I don't typically do much negotiation. Uh, you tell me what you need. I tell you what it costs, and you either say yes or no. No. And um, and so they they sort of explained what they need, and they said, oh, and we have like ten thousand dollars. I was like, that's cool. I I would love to do this project, but it's a minimum of twenty for this. Yeah. And and she just said, oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's kind of it's it, it's <laughs> it's just being transparent with what your your price point is and. Um, and sticking with it, you know, I, I think that uh, you, you, you've you been a really great guest, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Social Marketing Academy. Um, I, I think that you really shed a lot of light on the animation and kind of the misconceptions um, as to why you should use it for your business rather than not consider it. Um, is there anything coming up that you want to tell any of our listeners about or maybe where to find you? Oh, no. I'll put all of the, I'll put, put all your links into our description. So check out our description folks. Um, all the links to Alex will be there as well, but in, if you just want to give a shout out to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think what, what, you know, I, I'm based in DC, so this is the day before inauguration that we're, that we're actually talking. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to not having a bunch of uh, national guard troops in our city. I guess that's the thing I'm looking forward to, but um, personally, you know, please connect with us. Instagram, as, as much as I talked about Instagram earlier, you know, Instagram is primarily the way to connect with us and our work. Um, and, you know, of course, our website is dukeduck.com. Uh, 
this has been a, a real pleasure of a conversation. Thanks for getting into the weeds with me. It's it's my yeah, favorite. <laughs> no problem, Alex. I, I I mean I I really think what you offer is really important at your company, and I think more people need to check you out. So definitely check out the links, folks in the description of this show. Uh, uh, we have lots of great shows lined up. So if you have any questions, folks, I want to hear from you. Please um, check us out. Go salesandmarketing.com. That is the Go Agency's website. But why do you want to go there? Because the social media links are there. That's how you can get in contact with me and ask questions. What would you like to hear on an upcoming episode? What topic would you like us to cover? Check out our blog while you're there. There's a free e-course. Grab it. Who cares? Why not? Um, and I'll email you good stuff that you'll love and I'll endear myself to you and then you'll want to work with me. So um, in other words, thank you so much for joining us today. Alex, you've been a wonderful guest. And um, until next time, folks, thanks for watching and listening to the Social Marketing Academy. Until next time, folks.